Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm delighted to be here today. Um, thank you all for joining us to commemorate the 52nd anniversary of Title IX. The path to Title IX was a hard-fought victory which gave our girls equal opportunities in academics and athletics. And, but today, Title IX is under vicious attack by the Biden administration. Um, you know, our girls have trained for years to earn rightful titles, which have been stripped away by confused and sometimes predatorial men. That is why I've introduced the Congressional Review Act resolution to overturn the Biden administration's rule that completely undermines Title IX. And I remain hopeful that we'll have a vote soon on the floor. Um, I'd like to introduce our panel here, and I'm looking forward to a lively uh, conversation uh, on the future of Title IX. First, I'd like to introduce speaker Mike Johnson. He's the fifth... Speaker Johnson is the 56th Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives and was first elected to represent Louisiana's 4th Congressional District in 2016. Mike is a dedicated husband and father and an attorney who has devoted his life and career to fighting for the fundamental freedoms and traditional values that have made America the greatest nation in the history of the world. He spent nearly 20 years successfully litigating high-profile constitutional law cases in district and appellate courts nationwide and previously served on the Louisiana legislature. Next, I'd like to introduce Congresswoman Virginia Fox. <laughs> Congresswoman Fox represents North Carolina's 5th District in the United States House of Representatives and has been a tireless advocate for Title IX during her 20 years in Congress. She currently serves as the chairwoman of the House Committee on Education and Workforce, where I'm privileged to serve with her as vice chairwoman. And truly, no one works harder than Dr. Fox. <laughs> Thank you. And next, I'd like to introduce Betsy DeVos. Betsy. <laughs> Betsy is a leader and a disruptor and a champion for freedom. She is the nation's leading advocate for education freedom for students of all ages, having served as the 11th Secretary of Education from 2017 to 2021. For more than three decades, she has been tireless in her pursuit of public policy reforms that get government out of the way and allow students the freedom flexibility, resources, and support they need to choose where, when, and how they learn. Her advocacy has helped create new educational choices for K-12 through students in more than 25 states and the District of Columbia, and expanded post-high school education options for students and adult learners alike. Next, I'd like to introduce Heather Higgins. Heather is the chairwoman of the Independent Women's Forum, where she uses her passion for creating opportunity society for everyone to create a vision and overall strategy for independent women's efforts. And finally, I'd like to introduce Riley Gaines. <laughs> Riley is a leader defending women's single space single sex spaces, advocating for equality and fairness, and standing up for women's safety, privacy, and equal opportunities. Riley graduated from the University of Kentucky, where she was a 12-time All-American swimmer. After Riley directly experienced competing against a man in women's sports, being forced without warning or consent to undress before the fully intact male, and subjected to discrimination by the NCAA, she became one of the most powerful voices to speak out against the injustice, challenging the rules of the NCAA USA swimming. <laughs> Thank you. 
in addition to challenging the International Olympic Committee and other governing bodies. Riley now works for the leading women's organization, making real and lasting change, legally defining woman, protecting Title IX, and defending women's rights to single-sex spaces and equal opportunities. She has traveled the country speaking and has testified before the U.S. Senate, the U.S. House, and countless state legislatures. Please join me in welcoming the panel. Well, thank you all for being here. It's an important day, and I'm so grateful to Congresswoman Mary Miller. She represents Southern Illinois so well, and she's been a champion. Yay, they say. Yay. <laughs> she really has been a champion for protecting women and girls in so many ways, and we need strong voices like that. And I've got to tell you, as Speaker of the House, I get uh, the great opportunity to serve on some very distinguished panels, but I, I scarcely get one this distinguished. I'm really a big fan of all the ladies here uh, and Congresswoman Miller as well. Um, they've done extraordinary work. They've been champions for an important cause, and we want to celebrate that today and their work and hear some of their insights because they have really uh, unique insights and they're experts on the, on the topic. So you know we're celebrating the 52nd anniversary of Title IX. It's easy for me to remember because I was born in 1972 as well. Um, <laughs> and um, it's been very, very important my whole life and uh, most of all of your lives as well. But here's the problem. When President Biden took office, as you know, he began to issue a flurry of executive orders and make all sorts of pronouncements, and he told us from his first day in office that they were going to rewrite Title IX. They were going to dramatically revise it. And that was an ominous warning, and they made good on it. As you know, the Department of Education, the, the Federal Department of Education, has uh, gone about its effort to rewrite Title IX, and it's, it's having a very devastating effect. It's something that is of great alarm to all of us because it's a harm, and it, it could be a great harm to to women and girls, and especially in athletics and all these other arenas. And so we're going to talk about that today, talk about the harm and what can be done about it. Now, you know, states are already stepping up because um, they're so concerned about this as well, and some have begun to file suit. And uh, I'm proud to tell you, as a Louisianian, the first injunction has been issued now down in the Western District of Louisiana. The chief judge down there, Terry Doty, has done a great job in handling this. And I wanted to read you a little excerpt of that opinion because um, I think it's an important one. This is the first injunction against the regulation prevents it from going into effect. And this is how the judge uh, concluded the decision. Quote, this case demonstrates the abuse of power by executive federal agencies in the rulemaking process. Right? The separation of powers and system of checks and balances exist in this country for a reason. Moreover, the abuse of power by administrative agencies is a threat to democracy, unquote. We could not say that any better ourselves. We agree with that wholeheartedly. And that is the problem, is that we have agencies in the federal government that have truly been weaponized against the people, the very people that these agencies are designed to serve and protect. Right now, they're doing the opposite. This judge is exactly right. We expect more of this in the courts, and we'll have to be doing a lot of advocacy in the days and weeks and months and years ahead. We've got to stand for the right thing. I'm so glad that these ladies do that in all of the various ways that they're empowered, and, and I'm so happy to serve as the uh, moderator for the panel. I don't get to do this very often. It's kind of cool. So I got some questions for each of them, and I'm going to start down at the end with uh, Chairwoman Virginia Fox, who is a force of nature, as you know. Uh, nobody messes with Virginia, and I'm so glad she's on my side. Um, let me start with you. So we're remembering, of course, the importance of Title IX. Can you briefly explain what Title IX is and why it was enacted in the first place. Well, I, <clears throat> I remember when Title IX was passed in 1972. I was working at Appalachian State University at the time, and it was passed in a bipartisan way. By the way, we had President Nixon as president, but Democrats were in control of the Congress. And that was a time when Democrats knew what the difference was between a man and a woman. <laughs> I mean, times have changed. Yeah. Uh, everyone understood at the time that women were being disadvantaged and not being treated fairly. And so the idea was to make sure that women had the same opportunities. That's, oh. <laughs> women had the same opportunities as men in terms of sports. And so scholarships were uh, developed for women in sports. And 
again, people realized that women needed those opportunities, needed those scholarships. And for I've been accused of being uh, a transphobic. Well, for somebody who has worked all her life for the rights of women and who supported Title IX when it was passed, that's pretty much uh, of a crazy thing to say. But the whole idea behind Title IX is to treat men and women in opportunity and in scholarships equally. And at the time, it was a bipartisan issue. Again, men, I mean, Democrats seemed to know what a woman was in those days and what a man was. Thank you, Dr. Fox. She's such a commanding presence, even the Speaker of the House didn't want to tell her to lift the microphone up to her. <laughs> okay. I just assume you could hear her. Okay. Um, so let me go on to uh, someone who uh, may be one of the best-known uh, personalities in America now and a very famous face, Riley Gaines, who's done such a great job. We've been praying her through all this. An accomplished collegiate swimmer, and you were the a direct beneficiary of Title IX, of course. Um, so the question is, can you explain the value of female-only competition and how that environment shaped you? And can you share a little bit about radical gender ideology and how that's changed all that? Of course. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, the, the value here, let me just start by saying, I, I don't think I fully understood what Title IX really was, to be honest with you. I didn't understand that I was indebted to those women like Dr. Fox who fought for me, who fought so I could have the opportunities that I had to compete and to succeed. Um, I, I guess I just call it naivety maybe, maybe I was just naive to it all. Uh, this is certainly new to me in terms of understanding the political space who in their right minds would voluntarily do this. God bless you guys. <laughs> um, so I, I didn't understand really what was at stake, let's put it that way, until I was directly impacted, until I suffered the injustice we all did at that national championships of competing against a man, a six foot four man, fully intact, exposing himself in our locker rooms, we saw the unfair competition. Uh, we felt the betrayal in the locker room space. We, I mean, were effectively silenced and muzzled by our universities. Um, but the value that I got to, to reap in my 18-year career by the time I, I mean, four years old all the way through 22, it taught me how to be a leader. Uh, it taught me how to persevere, how to be resilient. It taught me how to set goals and work to achieve those goals. Um, things that transcend far beyond athletics, I'm realizing now. Things that have helped me in this space uh, far more, actually, than they helped me when I was an athlete. Um, there was a recent Ernst & Young study that came out that said 94% um, of female C-level executives, 94% uh, of those females were female athletes. And I think that right there shows you the skill sets, the value, uh, the leadership you develop from playing sports. And to answer very briefly the second part of how this radical gender, gender ideology has shaped society as we know it, we have seen this not only affect sports. We have seen how this affects now sororities. We have seen how this has affected prisons, domestic violence shelters. I mean, the language by which we use, uh, the English language. Notice we're referring to ourselves as biological women. What a silly thing. What a silly, redundant thing as if we're not made, all of us, made of biological matter. Why are we even doing that? Um, I, I thought at first, to answer very briefly and to show, I guess, how far personally I've come in understanding this topic, I thought at first it was kind to use the pronouns, the preferred pronouns, the biologically incorrect pronouns. I thought that's what respect was. That's what they told us respect was. And I was in an interview at the very beginning of all this talking about this and, and they were asking about the locker room and I tell you, I said the sentence, it came out of my mouth, her male genitalia, her penis. <laughs> and I'm s sitting there and I was ashamed of myself. I felt guilty, I felt like I had just entirely ignored the instincts, the gut instinct that I had for so long. Of course we all knew it was wrong, we all knew it was unfair. Um, but again, all of that just to, to highlight how this has infiltrated into corporate America, the media, academia, virtually every realm you could imagine, this movement has, has a chokehold on the American people. 
Well, thanks for those insights. Uh, another uh, champion for all things good and for women's uh, rights is a lady sitting to my, my immediate left, and the Secretary uh, DeVos, and she has been uh, someone we've all looked up to. And during the Trump administration, you helped uh, revise and reinvigorate Title IX after President Obama and his administration had stripped some of the protections for women. So we were grateful for your leadership there. Were there warning signs then for the moves we're seeing from President Biden today? And if so, how should we address them? Well, let me start by saying thank you to you, Speaker Johnson, for really highlighting this important issue and, um, and underscoring its importance to all Americans. Let me just say that when we came into office, we were very clear what the definition of sex was, male and female. The Obama-Biden administration had confused things, starting with a dear colleague letter that was sent to all education institutions um, insisting that they begin to treat individuals according to the identity that they chose to be and therefore, uh, and, and follow, following on with the private spaces that those individuals would choose to um, enter. And uh, so when we came into office, we it was very clear that in addition to those factors, as well as the kangaroo courts that were resulting from this dear colleague letter, uh, totally compromising the original intent of Title IX, that we would have to regulate around uh, the original intent of Title IX. So we did that. We put a stop to um, those requirements that the Dear Colleague letter put in place. And uh, we also opened investigations into what was happening in Connecticut, where um, one of uh, Riley's uh, fellow busmates from the last few weeks, uh, Selena Soleil from Connecticut, a track and field um, athlete, had been really denied opportunities as a result of biological males competing as women on the track and field competitions. That investigation um, was not able to be completed in our term, and it's not surprising that the new Biden administration immediately, immediately put a stop to the investigation and, uh, and, and really basically ignored the issues at hand. So this issue has been building for the past two um, Democrat administrations, and um, we are where we are as a result of that today. Thank you for that. Uh, Chairwoman Higgins, you uh, lead IWF, which has been at the forefront of organizing and activating women to protect their rights, and we thank you for that uh, important work. In addition to the Department of Education's regulation, what are the current legal challenges we're seeing regarding gender ideology, and what are the successes that IWF has made so far to protect women from having to compete against men in their own sports? Um, first, let me say thank you to you for having this event. It's terribly important that we recognize how far we've come and how quickly we are regressing uh, and take that on. And I wanted to thank Representative Miller and your 67 co-signers for the Congressional Review Act to take this on this challenge. I would encourage any other members who are here who haven't uh, joined in that coalition to do so. Um, I also want to thank the panel for having me <clears throat> representing as I do non-athletes who are concerned about Title IX. You don't have to be an athlete to be very worried about what's going on with the gender ideology fight. Independent Women's Forum was created in the wake of the Clarence Thomas hearings, but it is a group of people who are not only pro-women, we also like men. <laughs> and we, we like to have language be clear and honest, yes. <laughs> and, and as such, you know, we talk about a wide range of policy issues, and we never thought that we'd actually have to deal with fairness to women in sports and single-spec sp spaces because of Title IX. And yet, in 2018, in the last administration, as soon as that happened in Connecticut, with a completely uh, no alteration biological males running in track and field against the girls, we could see where the left was heading, and we knew what this fight was going to be about. So we started with the, telling the stories, finding the athletes like Riley, and bringing them to the fore not just in sports, that's obviously one of the most important and obvious places, but this gender ideology fight 
has many, many different facets. It is affecting detransitioners and young people who have other issues. They get pulled into the whole easy fix for their ostensible problems and then often creating irreparable harm to them. Uh, you have the problem in sororities now. You have the problem in women's prisons where males are being incarcerated with the women because they simply choose. And if you were a guy, why wouldn't you choose to go be in a woman's prison instead of a man's prison? Um, so we do, we're very busy telling the stories. We have litigation that we've now um, written because we don't think you should have to be a biologist to be able to define what a woman is. But um, uh, this law has now passed in eight states and we really want to thank the members of the House and Senate who've introduced it here. Hopefully we'll have a good president who will actually sign it. Um, down the road. Um, but we also have a lot of litigation going on. And for anybody who's in the room who has questions, May Melman, who heads the Independent Women's uh, Law Center, is there. But we've got litigation going on. Several things challenging Title IX. You're challenging the NCAA through the um, Our Bodies, Our Sports Coalition, which we helped birth. Um, and with some other great diverse organizations. Uh, but there's also uh, lawsuits going on having to do with sororities, and there's lawsuits having to go going on having to do with harms to women who've been permanently hurt by playing against these male athletes. And there are now challenges because there are things that are being called equal rights amendments that aren't, that they're trying to put on ballots. So there are many, many different fronts on which we are operating. Thanks for working in so many of those arenas, and there's much more to do, and Congress is not just sitting around. In the House, I'm happy to tell you that um, it will be next week, uh, we're rolling back uh, the administration's Title IX policy, and we're going to bring that up. And one of the champions has been Dr. Virginia Fox, and um, she has been fighting to protect women in the university and athletic system for a long time. Can you discuss what else Congress is doing uh, in, in this space to fight back? Yes, um, we passed Greg Stubbe's bill out of the Energy, uh, the, excuse me, Education and Workforce Committee. Um, it, um, uh, HR 734, Protection of Women and Girls in Sports. Now, I'm not an athlete either, Heather, but I have a granddaughter who was on the track team. She's pretty good at throwing. She followed her brother, who was a pretty good thrower on the track team. But I cannot imagine her having to compete against the males on the track team because she would never be able to win. And so what we want to do is, again, to protect the rights that women won in Title IX. And I have to say, that Secretary DeVos spent a long time working on getting Title IX rules and regulations right. Um, and, and then the Biden administration has thrown them out. But we have passed out of committee Representative Miller's uh, Congressional Review Act, uh, which we will bring to the floor, I hope, soon. And so those are two of the things that we can do the Congressional Review Act would roll back these new rules put out by the Biden administration that negate most of the work that was done under Secretary DeVos, which was extraordinarily thoughtful and well done and not didn't just protect women and girls in sports, but went further in the whole area of Title IX, which has not gotten a lot of attention but is very important. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Um, Riley, another question for you, and I, this is personal for me. It's personal for all of us. I'm a father. My wife, Kelly's here. Kelly, raise your hand. Okay, Kelly's here. We got four children, two daughters. One of them's here. Abby, raise your hand. I brought visual aids. Okay. Um, <laughs> This is, this is very important to us. Both of my girls were athletes, proud to say. They're both now law students, but they have been cheering you along um, because you represent so many other young women like them, you know, and you, you've been a symbol for all of them. And you've been traveling around the country on a bus tour sharing your story and talking with people who've had similar experiences. Tell us a little bit about what you've seen and heard and how widespread is this radical gender ideology? How's it impacting the young women of this country? Yeah. Uh, we have been on a, a bus tour, and that is exactly what it sounds like, <laughs> a big bus <laughs> with our faces on it uh, that is traveling from coast to coast, border to border, 
Uh, and I imagine you, I know certainly speaking for myself, uh, I had the opposite reaction of Kamala Harris when seeing my face on a bus. I was like, oh my gosh, so what is this? Um, but it's been amazing. We have been able to have a, a very diverse group, a, a large coalition. Um, the Our Bodies, Our Sports Coalition made up of, of groups who are traditionally conservative, who um, fight for conservative values. Uh, but we've gone all the way on the other side. Even last night we were here in D.C. Uh, it was amazing. We had Martina Navratilova standing right alongside us, um, speaking to, to the community, to people who are concerned about this issue. Common sense, everyday Americans who intuitively know that men and women are different. Um, so it's not just one demographic we're appealing to here. It really is. It's, it's widespread. Uh, lots of people who call themselves lifelong liberals who are standing alongside us, um, what I've noticed in going to these different states, there's even a lot of people who are a part of the LGB, I think more so the LGB, but even broader, the LGBTQ community who are there saying, hey, this is wrong. Um, we see the harm. We see the severity. This isn't what, what we stand for. Um, so it's cool. It, it really is a unifying issue, and that's not the way that it's portrayed. It's not the way it's portrayed by Congress, which... When the Protection of Women and Girls in Sports Act was introduced, Representative Greg Stubbe's bill, it fell entirely on party lines, meaning 219 Republicans voted in favor of protecting women and girls in sports, and all 203, every single last one of them, mothers and fathers of their own young daughters, all 203 Democrats voted in opposition of protecting women and girls in sports. It's not the way the media portrays this issue. It doesn't portray it as a unifying issue. If you were, were to just watch the news, you would think this is super divisive. You would think it's, it's partisan. It's something that is polarizing. But again, that's not the case. Over every poll shows it, every Gallup poll shows it, over 70%, and I think that number is higher, over 70% of Americans agree that it's harmful to allow men into women's sports. Um, you and I, I think everyone on this panel, everyone in this room knows that there's not a lot of issues that are deemed political that 70-plus percent of Americans can agree on. But this right here is one of them. Well said. Secretary DeVos, from a regulatory perspective, schools have faced changing guidance on Title IX since 2016. Can you explain the effect of ever-changing Title IX regs on schools and describe how Congress can maybe help stop the confusion? Well, certainly. I mean, it's very untenable for um, education institutions to have a, a regulation come from or a, a law to follow that Congress has passed and then get a regulation handed down by administrations that have a different agenda. So it has been like whiplash for um, many of these institutions. Um, there's a reason why there's only 37 words in the original law because it's a very clear, common-sense approach to how we deal with giving women equal opportunity. Um, and there's a, real, there's a reason why the regulation that we uh, went through during our administration has withstood legal tests because we followed the law. Uh, the regulations and the, uh, you know, the, the, the colleague letters that these that the Obama and Biden administrations have put forward simply aren't following the law. We're seeing it with the, law, the, the two cases that have now been enjoined, have enjoined 10 states from implementing this, this rule. And uh, um, so it's time to get this very clarified, and Congress has a opportunity to do that with the Congressional Review Act. And I thank uh, Congresswoman Miller and Congresswoman Fox and all of, uh, all of the leaders in, uh, in the House that are really standing up on this issue. It is time to uh, return to the original intent of Title IX and, um, and, and have common sense prevail again. So well said. Uh, and Chairwoman Higgins, many young female athletes and their parents are concerned about the future of women's sports. So what's your advice to them for how they can get involved in this battle? Um, well, we really first want to encourage them to be involved. The more voices, the better. We're in, it's one of the things that makes Riley and some of the other athletes who are here. Um, can, can you guys stand up? You know, those of you who have been on the bus tour and who've stood up for this issue... This is a, a diverse group of women. Uh, they are not all Republicans. In fact, probably less than half are. 
We'll work but, on that. I'm yeah, we're working on it. We're working on it. Um, but they, but they want to speak truth, and I think they just all deserve to be congratulated because it's really hard to be one of the first ones to stand up. But the more people stand up, the more people say that this is wrong, this is this is insane, this is hurting women. We can do something about it. The more you find each other, come to IWF.org. Um, certainly follow Riley on Twitter, always an exciting read. Um, and, th you know, there are constant fights that need people to weigh in and show up. Um, we wound up testifying over 50 times in different state legislatures last year, never mind all the congressional testimony we did, and a lot of that was people telling their stories. So share your stories. Uh, you'll find on our website lots of stories that may be like your own, and if you know someone who has a good story, we'd love to tell their story too, and, and the more stories there are, that's how we change the narrative. That's how we change the public mind. That's how we get the, that number to grow from 73% at last polling to maybe an 80 or 90% issue. Unfortunately, there's always about 25% that get any polling question wrong, but, but we're getting pretty close. I'm, I'm so grateful for that and these voices. And I would just say this, what I, what I really admire and respect about all of you and what you're doing, the bus tour and all of it, is that you come at it with the right tone. It's not just the right message, but it's the right tone. You are showing dignity and respect for all people. You're showing that you're winsome warriors. It is a battle, but you're winsome warriors, you know, and that's how you win people over to common sense is you just present the truth in a winsome way. And everybody on this panel is such a champion for that, and, and you ladies are as well, and, and thank you for doing that and being bold enough to do what's not always the most popular thing. I love the 70% number. Even I'm encouraged by that. I didn't know it was that high. But um, you, we would do this even if it weren't popular. You know what? Because I had a mentor tell me when I was in eighth grade, Mike, always remember what is popular isn't always right, and what is right isn't always popular, right? We do the right thing, and then people will come along eventually. So um, I, I, I think we could keep them up here for a couple of hours, and I know we'd all be riveted by the um, information, but we want to be a good steward of your time. So, so grateful to these awesome women, to Congresswoman Miller and Dr. Fox and Chairwoman Higgins, <laughs> Riley, <laughs> Secretary DeVos. Um, Thanks to all of you for all the hard work, and thanks to all of you for being here, and let's, uh, let's stay in the fight. God bless you. Appreciate it so much.